pandemic left uh, public debt in Europe soaring to levels last seen in the wake of the Second World War. And against that backdrop, today's webinar will address several burning questions. The first question is, to what extent has the level of desirable and sustainable debt changed in view of the pandemic uh, recovery spending and a low interest rates? And the second question is more generally, what is the place of public debt in a well-functioning system of economic and fiscal governance? And the third question is, how should these issues be considered in the current debate about fiscal rules in the European Union? Well, let me welcome three panelists. Uh, the first one is, uh, the first one I want to mention is Barry Eigengreen. He hardly needs any introduction. He is one of the great economic historians of our time and has just published his international bestseller in defense of public debt. So the timing for having him here is, is really perfect. The second speaker will be Agnès benesi Carré, who is not only a renowned macroeconomist, but also at the center of power of economic policymaking in France. And let me recall that France holds the president, EU presidency in the first half of next year, uh, on which Agnès will undoubtedly leave her footprint. So the timing to have here couldn't be better either. And our third speaker is Walter Schoeckle, uh, yet another high-powered academic specialized in the political economy of the Euro. And she recently published a seminal book on this titled The Political Economy of Monetary Solidarity, Understanding the Experiment of the Euro. Now I will invite each of the three panelists to give a short introduction of maximum 15 minutes, followed by a round of discussion and I will then open the floor for questions by the audience, if that is technically feasible. Um, we start with the, his, the historical perspective uh, with Barry, and then next look at Agnes with a view from the policy-making circuit, and then end with a view from a political economy angle with Walchard. So Agnes, let me give you the floor. Oh, sorry, uh, Barry, let me give you the floor. This is my first mistake, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Inevitably, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, this book, um, co-authored with Asma El Ganeni, Rui Estevez, and, and Chris Michener. Um, it's not too much of a stretch because uh, the Netherlands features prominently in our story. Uh, the book is, in, in a sense, Eurocentric because the history of public debt is uh, Eurocentric. Uh, Europe's physical geography, a continent divided up into many polities historically as a result uh, of uh, mountain ranges and, and river valleys made for frequent war and uh, the frequency of war made for the uh, frequency uh, of sovereign debt issuance. Uh, the Netherlands features prominently in this story as well, because it's a, a, a case where political changes uh, fostered the development a, a, of a market in public debt. So you can see here what happened to real interest rates on Dutch public debt over the critical period when the Estates General was established and, and political uh, checks and balances on uh, the sovereign and the state were put in place. This was the period when sovereign debt came to be recognized as an obligation of the state ran rather than of the individual occupying the throne. And I think what happened to uh, real borrowing costs over that century and a half is quite remarkable, declining from more than 8% to less than 2% as a result of commercial changes, economic changes, but importantly, political changes. Um, we emphasize how over time, the uses of public debt evolved. Uh, financing wars has always been a, of 
premier importance as I show you uh, on the right in the case of, of the United States. Here you see the debt to GDP ratio and how its evolution in the US was punctuated by the War of 1812, the US Civil War, World War I, World War II. Debt uh, was always issued to meet public health emergencies. Uh, uh, Siena and, and, and Venice famously borrowed in the 14th century in order to meet the public debt and uh, public health emergency that was uh, the Black Death. Starting in the 19th century, uh, governments also borrowed to invest in, in productive infrastructure in the roads, railways, ports, urban lighting, and sewers associated with modern economic growth. And the Dutch states have borrowed periodically to finance investments in what we might call climate change uh, uh, abatement to build dikes and, 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 and protect uh, the land against uh, rising sea level. So there is precedent in history for all of this, if you will. Um, while uh, responsible states borrow in order to meet those kind of emergencies, they also uh, then move to enhance or restore that capacity to borrow once the emergency uh, has passed. And I think we know in the present case that there will be another emergency. There will be another novel coronavirus, financial crisis, climate disaster, uh, geopolitical event in response to which uh, governments are going to have to do whatever it takes, mobilize all available resources, including those that can only be mobilized by issuing debt. So I would argue that prudent governments ought to start thinking now about uh, restoring and enhancing their capacity to borrow uh, in, in the not too distant future. Uh, in the book, we look at a number of historic episodes where states have done just that, where they have brought down their debt to GDP ratios over time. Um, we do that not in order to draw parallels with the past, but precisely in order to highlight what's different between now and then, and to uh, uh, identify what might be possible now. So the, we use the, uh, the economist standard debt decomposition, where the change in the debt to GDP ratio, little d, over time, depends on, on government's primary budget surpluses again over time uh, on the uh, interest rate growth rate uh, differential, little i being the interest rate on debt, little gamma being the growth rate, uh, nominal growth rate of the economy multiplied by the inherited stock of debt. And then the stock flow adjustment is just everything else, uh, adjustments you need in order to uh, reconcile the observed flow of interest payments and flow of primary budget surpluses with the change in the stock of debt over time. So we put this uh, uh, equation to work in a num number of historical episodes, um, including three 19th century episodes where debts were consolidated entirely by governments running primary budget surpluses over long periods of time. In the British case, so I, to my eyes, this is quite a remarkable figure where uh, Britain emerged from the Napoleonic and French wars with a debt to GDP ratio of 200%, which it effectively extinguished over the succeeding 90 years up to the eve of World War I by running primary budget surpluses. So you can see the stock of debt, uh, solid line, left-hand side axis, and the primary budget surplus, dotted line, right-hand side uh, vertical axis. Uh, there was uh, outstanding fiscal philosophy at the time, emphasizing budget surpluses, low taxes, limited budget. There was the perceived need to restore the ability to borrow uh, in advance of a future conflict, uh, perhaps with France, perhaps with Germany, there was the limited influence of the working class in parliament uh, prior to the establishment of 
the universal franchise in the 20th century. Um, the same picture is evident in the United States after our Civil War. Uh, public debt accumulated as a result of the war was essentially uh, extinguished over the succeeding 50 years as a result of the government running primary surpluses year after year for fully half a century, with the sole exception of a couple of years around the time of the Spanish-American War. So uh, when people ask, how did the United States do that? They are often tempted to say, they often say, as a result of the rapid growth of the US economy, uh, industrialization and large scale immigration, not true. It was uh, this ability to run primary surpluses uh, successively every virtually every year for five decades that extinguished the debt. And finally, the case of France after the uh, Franco-Prussian War, uh, a somewhat shorter period, a slightly less dramatic episode, but again, a political class that was galvanized into running primary surpluses in anticipation of the possible need to borrow to fight uh, a future war. So we, um, I show you here the arithmetic involved. It's probably clearest in the case of France, the bottom row of the table. So you can see that the debt to GDP ratio over the 20 years in question declined from 95% to 51%, a 44.5% decrease in the debt ratio entirely accounted for by primary surpluses. Uh, the case of the United States, the middle row, the decrease is uh, a bit smaller in uh, absolute terms, but it's again entirely the primary surplus that accounts for that decline. And uh, in the case of, uh, of the UK, uh, the economy grew, but not at the same, not uh, at the level of interest rates on the public debt. So the growth rate in interest rate differential contributed negatively to debt reduction over the period. It was more than fully accounted for by primary surpluses. Um, that arrow reminds you that it's not rapid growth in the US case. This circle uh, uh, attracts your eyes to Goshen's uh, debt conversion operation, which saved the Exchequer, uh, 1888 operation that ex saved the Exchequer a whole lot in terms of um, debt service. We also look at the book at some other cases that you would not want to emulate, uh, how hyperinflation liquidated uh, the German public debt after World War I at a cost, namely very high borrowing costs for uh, the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, not to mention contributing to the political polarization that so unfortunately played out in, in the 1930s. We look at um, uh, debt reduction, debt consolidation in the advanced economies after World War II, when a combination of approaches was used, growing the economy, uh, capping interest rates through statutory restrictions and, and the maintenance of controls on international capital flows, bottling up savings at home, in other words, but also running primary surpluses. So I, I, I circled the contribution of the primary balance here, partly, uh, again, because I think it is quite remarkable and neglected in historical accounts. This was the period when governments were growing the welfare state, if you will, but they did not grow it at the expense of fiscal consolidation. They were able at the very same time to run primary budget surpluses. So the UK is uh, a notable case. Again, came out of World War II with a debt to GDP ratio like 200%. It was establishing the public health service, national health service, uh, increasing social spending from four to 8% of GDP over the third quarter of the 20th century, but at the same time, able to run primary budget surpluses and bring down the debt ratio. 
So the question is, can we do something similar today? Ugo Panitza and I looked at this question uh, a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago. Now we looked at how many advanced economies had been able to run primary budget surpluses as large as 5% of GDP for as many as 10 consecutive years. And we found only three cases, three anomalous cases. Uh, Norway, after it discovered large amounts of oil and gas in the North Sea, which it wanted to salt away for future generations. Belgium, after 1995, Belgium, recall, was the European country with the highest debt to GDP ratio in Europe at the time, higher than Italy, higher than Greece. It had to convince its European partners that it would be a reliable member of the Euro area, which it did by beginning to bring its debt to GDP ratio down toward the Maastricht reference values. And Singapore with its impeccably strong technocratic government and its powerful sovereign wealth funds after 1990. So the, this is a way of saying normal, normal governments, especially in an age of political polarization, are not able to do this. They're not able to run very large primary surpluses for very long periods of time. What about uh, in, inflating away the debt? So some economists such as uh, Charles Goodhart argue that uh, inflation will contribute importantly to debt consolidation in coming years. Uh, Charles and Manoj write in their book about five to 10% inflation for, for an extended period. They don't specify going forward. I'm skeptical. That story may apply in the UK where the average maturity of government debt is 14 years. It won't apply in the US where the average maturity of public debt is five years. Investors will adjust, they will shorten maturities if they see persistent inflation coming. So the increase in, infl in inflation will have to be very large. Uh, there will have to be repeated inflationary surprises, ratchets upward for this to work. I think the creditors lobby of uh, pension funds and insurance companies and individual investors in sovereign debt is powerful and they will all scream bloody murder if uh, an inflation is used to uh, wipe out a significant part of the debt. And I uh, continue to believe that stability culture is deeply ingrained in today's central banking community. I think if the Fed's commitment to uh, its inflation target and its independence could survive Donald Trump, they can survive anything. So um, you can have me back in five years to um, talk about wh whether this forecast was right or wrong. So I don't think it will be mainly inflation. Uh, I don't think it will be solely debt consolidation. I don't think it will be entirely faster growth. Growing the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio is the painless way of consolidating the debt. That's what Europe is hoping for with its recovery fund. That's what the Biden administration is hoping for with its infrastructure plan. That's, we're all, that's what we're all hoping for on the assumption that uh, the migration to Zoom digitization during uh, COVID has uh, led, enabled business to figure out how to do things more efficiently. I think they're still figuring out and they haven't figured out how to do work from home and they haven't figured out how and who and when people are going back to the office. I think history suggests that productivity growth accelerates in response to new general purpose technologies like the personal computer, the internal combustion engine, the steam engine only with a considerable lag. So this may happen, but it's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, what do I conclude? I, I conclude, unfortunately, that there are no simple solutions. History tells us that countries that have successfully addressed problems of debt sustainability without major economic, financial, and political dislocations,
have done so by exerting fiscal effort, turning to fiscal restraint when the time is right, by growing their economies, and by avoiding deflation, maybe even by running modest rates of inflation. That is the best that we can hope for going forward, uh, and I think we should hope. So um, thank you for the time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Barry. Um, maybe it's time now to look at the, uh, the practical side of things. What is in store for the next half a year or year or two years or so? And if there's anybody better place to, to give him, give us, to enlighten us, uh, then it would be Agnes. Agnes, can you, can you come in? Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Thanks for the invitation. Actually, I'm going to uh, make a few remarks consistent uh, with what Barry just said uh, to try to draw uh, some uh, practical lessons for today. Um, so, can you see my screen? Yeah? I can see it, yes. Okay. So, these are my personal views. It, it doesn't uh, say anything about uh, the, the French uh, presidency of the EU. Uh, nor uh, of uh, anything that the Treasury would, would see. It's just really personal views. So I, I wanted to, to, to start with uh, the very uh, naive question of what is the adequate level of public debt? And then you have a number of uh, answers. Uh, the, the, of course, the, the answer we all have in mind in Europe is the, the answer in the Stability and Growth Pact, which is 60%. So this is uh, the adequate level of public debt. It comes back to it goes back to to Maastricht Treaty, and it uh, it's uh, it's it's been um, um, made more uh, well more binding with the so-called one twentieth rule, meaning that uh, every year a gov government should reduce its debt to GDP ratio by one twelfth of the excess debt with respect to this threshold of 60%. Uh, then uh, in the 90s, you also had the uh, Reinhard Rogoff view uh, saying that above a, a certain threshold, which at that time at some point was 90%, but then it, it, uh, it was, uh, this threshold was questioned. Uh, so above a certain threshold, the higher debt ratio would reduce GDP growth, hence you would, not, uh, you, you would uh, avoid crossing this threshold. Uh, another view is the Musgrave and Musgrave view, which uh, openly says that there's a trade-off. Uh, so uh, starting from the post-COVID level of debt, you need to reduce the uh, debt ratio in order to recover space for the next crisis, to stabilize the next crisis. But at the same time, so this is the stabilization purpose of, uh, of um, fiscal policy. But then uh, you have a second purpose, which is allocation. And uh, since there are market failures, the market is not able to uh, carry out the green transition. There is a need for public investment, public intervention at large. And so this goes in opposite respect to the stabilization pur purpose. So maybe uh, according to this allocation view, uh, the uh, level of debt uh, is uh, Maybe the right one or, or, or even a higher one uh, would be uh, required, but it goes uh, in opposite direction with respect to stabilization. And then, of course, everybody has in mind the R minus G view, uh, the idea that uh, the difference between uh, low difference between uh, the interest rate and the growth rate allows for higher permanent debt. Uh, you also have the R star view uh, saying that actually more public debt is welcome because it means for well, more public debt from advanced economies is welcome, it means more safe assets, hence a higher neutral interest rate, hence more space for, for monetary policy, and the economy will be more stable if monetary policy has more space to stabilize. Um, then uh, you had a market view saying that spreads are difficult to predict, and what is important is not R minus G, but R plus lambda minus G, where lambda is a risk premium. And the risk premium is something quite mysterious. Uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult actually to, to build a, a, um, a robust economic model for the risk premium. 
So what does it mean in practice? <laughs> you, at, at the end of the day, you're a bit lost uh, when you need to, to give policy advice. Uh, so what it seems to say is that what we need is perhaps less uh, a threshold, a less uh, a, a level, uh, um, normative uh, level of debt. We uh, rather need a credible downward path for the debt to GDP ratio post crisis. So this ratio needs to uh, diminish, but at the right time. Hence, we also need a holistic macro approach. So the much depends on what happens in other areas, of course, on the economy, but in other areas of macro policies. I will come back to that in, in this. So everybody has in mind graphs say that, uh, so in blue, you have the debt to GDP, uh, sovereign debt to GDP ratio uh, in uh, advanced economies, as this is aggregate numbers, it goes up since 2001. And uh, simultaneously, you have a, a fall in the interest burden because the interest rate goes down faster than uh, the increase in the debt. So it's very, um, uh, it's, it's a temptation to uh, extrapolate uh, these graphs. However, if you look back in, in the past um, and you look over a long time, you know, the 18th so the, on average, uh, the R minus G was negative in use uh, economies. This is the first line of the table. But with a very, very large standard deviation, uh, up to 6.6% uh, percent points for, for Germany, compared to minus two on average. And if you uh, go by sub period, you see that over the uh, last two dates, uh, it was not in all trees that R minus G was negative. Uh, and you have a period well, of course, the uh, uh, 50s to uh, uh, 1979 uh, period was uh, a long period of negative R minus G with weight in the uh, long term average. So, if you uh, take another approach looking at the uh, frequency of periods where you see that it's about half of the, uh, of the years, uh, a little more than half of the year, like 50% of the time. You have up more than over the recent period. It's not in all countries. In Italy, it's zero percent of the time. Japan, five percent. So, uh, you have periods, as I said, in the fifties and sixties, seventies, uh, it's almost all of the time. So you have long periods where R minus G is negative, and then long periods with R minus G is positive. I forgot to say that here R is the apparent uh, nominal interest rate, so it's the ratio between interest payments and Times uh, I have made the decomposition that uh, Barry uh, showed, and we uh, the, the line is the variation, uh, the ratio variation from a year to year. Uh, blue is a contribution of a primary balance. So when it's positive, it's uh, it's primary deficit. And the orange is the snowball effect uh, with the stop for adjustment. And here, when you accumulate over two uh, decades, you end up with an increase in the debt ratio that is mainly explained by the accumulation of primary deficits, in fact. So primary deficits are still there, uh, which is uh, in a sense uh, not very good, uh, not very good. Uh, um, news for uh, how to to pursue thank you for having me for such an interesting uh debate and you know i'm extremely grateful that barry eichengreen and his co-authors have come up with this book i think it's a book that may not surprise you on the whole but it is worth saying and then saying it also with all this historical detail that of which he gave us a glimpse uh, earlier uh, and just show how helpful it is if governments can actually pile in when a crisis happens and have a much better combination of growth and fiscal consolidation. So let me uh, 
briefly say that I also think the European experience is extremely important. We often discuss these things with reference or implicitly reference to the United States. And the problem of that is uh, no country, no other country has since early last century this exorbitant privilege of the key currency. Um, in Europe, you find, and especially since the euro area crisis, you find countries that have that, that are now treated by financial markets like like uh, emerging markets, and the situation of this, uh, the policy architecture of the euro area even inflicts on some of these countries whose bonds are shunned by financial investors, uh, inflicts on them original sin. In other words, these countries are in a situation in which they have no control over the currency in which they issue the bonds. That is something the European thought never would never happen to them. And then it happened with the euro area crisis, okay? So what I want to do now is look at, uh, and, and that with this view that, you know, Latin American countries, uh, the more developed African countries, Asian countries, certainly, the European experience has some relevance, and I, I, I don't talk particularly about Europe, but I want to keep in mind that in a way this is more relevant for the rest of the world. And I answered the three questions I was asked. So the first is, what's the role of public debt in a well-functioning fiscal system? I think between the three panelists here and even the convener, Paul van der Noort, I think it is clear that we would say a soft budget constraint for the government is actually uh, the precondition that it can stabilize the economy, and that it, as Keynes said, can do something that the private sector would not do. So it's essential that the government can um, rig off, you know, increase public debt, increase its aggregate demand uh, when the public sector doesn't want and want actually to generate surpluses. Um, but it's also true in normal, so that is the case of counter-cyclical stabilization, right? And that uh, in that sense, that was so in essential because it says the government really must play a different role in the economy than the private sector can and has incentives to. And this basic Keynesian insight has to be spelled out. And uh, what Barry Eichengreen just did in his introduction is so when you don't do this, how costly that is. It costs the British probably their empire, that they tried to go down from a 200% GDP, uh, debt to GDP level down to this uh, low level through just fiscal consolidation. But in normal times and in aging societies like the Europeans, it's also important to have a safe asset. Uh, and it may sometimes be right to debt finance public investment, in fact, quite often, if namely the future generations have also benefit from it. Why should then the current generations only pay for it? And what I want to do here is to focus on the most topical and contested role in the EU right now. And I think with climate change that has a relevance for the rest of the world. And that is when you are hit by a common shock, like this pandemic was, really a shock in the sense of exogenous, nobody had, was responsible or guilty of this. But also when you have in a monetary union endogenous systemic instability, which I would call that our monetary integration that we did with very little fiscal integration had somehow on the back of it a lot of financial integration that was not backed up by safety nets, by fiscal capacity to help collectively when a country gets in difficulties. And Ireland, rather than Greece, is always the incarnation of what the euro area crisis was. A country that had no fiscal uh, difficulties, that had benefited massively from European integration, monetary integration, um, and it all got very much into trouble. Uh, and it was an instability where the one interest rate uh, cannot target very different situations and you would basically need different instruments. Now, what can you do into, in such a case, especially when you have a common shock? That's the worst case for the risk pool when all are affected, right? The pandemic. Again, it is then only public debt that can help because first of all, you can rope in future generations into the risk pool, the taxpayers of tomorrow that can help to pay this back. And it's in their interest too, that the economy doesn't completely uh, collapse and, and impoverishes their parents, so to speak. 
but also, and it's sometimes forgotten, forgotten, the fortunate contemporaries. In other words, those who benefit then from the stabilization that public debt can uh, uh, engineer when the economy is hit by a common shock or a monetary union or a, a European Union, a collective of, of, of countries. The other is reinsurance. Uh, with a common shock or systemic instability, insurers, private insurers have a problem that is not of their making. They have a hard budget constraint. They must, as private firms, be able to go bankrupt. Therefore, they cannot guarantee for any, uh, you know, for highly correlated risks, which is what a common shock amounts to, they cannot guarantee not to go bankrupt. Which is why, for example, health insurers seek reinsurance for this catastrophic event that very expensive medical treatments become available and governments say you have to make that available. But, you know, they are so expensive there is their premium, their insurance premium were never written for that. And so they seek reinsurance for those cases. And this is what interstate solidarity also can provide. I mean, insurance for the insurer, for the welfare states of which Europe has the most developed and the most diverse, mature set of, of uh, social security systems. And that's the EIMF ESM principle. Those countries with good standing can use their lent their standing to a body like the IMF or the European Stability Mechanism to raise debt in uh, markets. They guarantee that they don't themselves uh, need to, to raise it. And then uh, these bodies, IMF, ESM, can give uh, credit at non-market conditions to countries that are harder hit, more vulnerable to a common check or to uh, systemic instability and then help them out to recover. Uh, and needless to say, I don't think this could, should come with a lot of intrusive and punitive conditionality. And then it is a real solidarity uh, mechanism that helps at very low cost to the other member states, those countries that, that may not, and they're perhaps subject to a self-fulfilling financial attack. Has the pandemic, that was the next question that Paul put to us, the change to desirable and sustainable level of public debt? Um, it would have been really nice if Agnes had already dealt with all the data uh, points, but I can make it brief. Yes, the, both the recovery facility that takes countries for a while as they try to get out of this pandemic, the shutdowns and so on, and low interest rates may have raised the sustainable level simply because you have uh, pushed the nominal interest rates at which bank can refinance business credit, household credit is way below even low growth rates. And actually, as we go out of the, of the pandemic, we have made actually quite decent growth rates. And that helps because you kind of grow out of your, of your legacy debt, uh, if that can be sustained for a while. Unfortunately, both the recovery facility and those low interest rates uh, are probably not at any, uh, you know, are only short term, at best, uh, small, medium term solutions. Because, and I'm supremely relaxed about the inflation. I think a lot of what is discussed at the moment as inflation is actually that some relative price changes like higher energy prices or higher price, higher wages for some uh, key sector workers feed through in what we then measure as higher uh, price levels or rising price levels. But to some extent, it has to happen. Uh, energy prices have to rise if we have, want to have any chance to uh, make the private sector adjust to this climate change challenge. So what I'm concerned about is that with this amount of liquidity at very low interest rates, it is no longer so much a matter of uh, you know, a liquidity trap where the financial sector just seeks liquidity to, to be safe, but they play casino with it in financial markets. So we are feeding the next boom bust cycle with a constellation like that. So we need intelligent financial repression that keeps this constellation of relatively low interest rate relative to the, the growth rate. And that's not easy in a continent of mature economies that are not growing at, you know, Chinese rates. 
I think what one can learn a bit from LTI, from the LTI, or the long-term refinancing operations, where uh, banks were guaranteed for three years at 1% refinancing rate, and everybody hoped or at least the ECB hoped that the banks would, would recapitalize themselves out of the margin between how they could refinance themselves at 1% and lend to uh, somebody, uh, businesses, uh, at a higher rate. Now, on the whole, I think the recapitalization out of the LTIO was not uh, breathtaking because the, the ECB could not steer that process. With the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchasing Program, I think, um, it had learned a lesson and did something what I would call intelligent financial repression. It, it uses banks as agents for business credit, perhaps also some household credit or prolonging mortgage credit, I don't know quite. But the banks were rewarded with negative interest rates to take that massive refinance and pass it on to businesses and these business credits, they were risky in a, in a pandemic where nobody knows how these firms that were shut down will recover. They were given a, a guarantee by, um, by the government. So this is a monetary fiscal cooperation we hadn't seen before. And through that, you can then also add some, you know, attach some strings to what banks do. And it has been also done uh, in the United States and that I would call intelligent financial repression, which I think otherwise uh, this whole constellation that we have will lead just to more boom bust cycles. Last question and my last slide. How should these insights be applied to the current debate about fiscal rules? Now, I must admit, when I hear fiscal rules, my brain stops a bit working. To me, fiscal rules for you know, what is ultimately a budget balance is a macroeconomic outcome, suffers from the same fallacy of composition as this Swabian housewife maxim of sound fiscal policy. In bad times, you have to tighten your belt, and then in good times, you can spend and, and, and uh, go a bit on a spending spree. I mean, this is pro-cyclical. And fiscal rules, you think that you can, can uh, you know, make... make um, governments in democracies uh, so fine-tune their, their fiscal balances is just absurd. Even if they try, it is an endogenous thing. It is endogenous to the political and to the economic uh, situation. Blanchard and others have talked about we should have standards, principles. I do see the difficulty for the EU Commission, if it wants to, if it feels some that the collectively the, the fiscal stance is, 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 is not sustainable, that it then cannot just pick out certain countries. It needs to have a benchmark against which it does this. But seeing these fiscal standards or principles more as an invitation to, to a conversation and assume that governments act in good faith would be a good start for a union in which you share a common currency. What I do think what has happened if with these massive interventions, and this is where I think perhaps I have a little footnote to or little criticism of Barry Eichengreen et al's book, that I think it is a bit too much still thinking in this old uh, style as uh, Weingast and people have done. Yeah, democracies are so credit worthy because they have these checks and balances, as if always the borrower is the problem. I think we have learned in the last 10, 15 years that the lenders are the problem. And we need to, to change the, the balance of risk bearing and sharing between public debtors and private creditors. Otherwise, we collectively, through our governments, always cover the downside risks, while financial markets uh, and financial investors uh, take all the upside risks. And there's, I have three ideas, and I think the EU as a union of rich countries, but with very diverse situations, could be the ones where you try these ideas out. I do understand that Latin America cannot do this because immediately markets would get very nervous, while I think the EU is such a big market that in a way you can also say, we can try this out, and if you want to go, just go. Uh, they will come back, the financial investors, I mean. The first is GDP growth linked bonds. In other words, you issue long-term bonds, 
but you you make the those who lend to you the creditors those who hold these bonds also share in the risk that in the long term growth may go up and down and that's all the more important as we have probably missed the boat on the climate change targets of two percent uh, celsius so we are in in for very very difficult times with respect to climate change where suddenly growth can collapse and why should the nations the taxpayers of of these countries be the only ones who bear that risk and not those uh, bond investors as well gdp growth linked bonds where the, the debt service varies with the growth would be one way of dealing with this and the europeans could just say a good share of every bond issue must be gdp growth linked then we would start to get experience on that and and have an uh, you know know what to do that's even more true for the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism it is to me perverse that we do not have a way for governments sovereign debtors to get orderly out of debt. I know that this is actually uh, opposed by, well, the Republicans in the United States and by emerging markets themselves, because of course they would immediately have to pay a bit higher uh, rates. But I'm afraid I have to say that I do think emerging markets are a bit too careless in their borrow borrowing behavior and that uh, it would be good if, if that's priced in a little bit more than it is at the moment. But we definitely need this at the moment. And even sensible conservative economists like Anne Kruger can see this. You know, uh, countries lose a lot. Even the, the, the borrowers, the, the good willing borrowers, uh, lenders, sorry, uh, lose a lot when one lets a situation deteriorate until the IMF has to ride to the rescue. And last but not least, and that's a bit of an innovative idea that I had when I was thinking about this. Just as we think, you know, the public debtors are perhaps uh, need a bit of a break and need a bit of support. This is also future generations that we have roped into our risk pools quite a lot these days. And I would say parliaments should think about and the EU commission could come up with some ideas of how one could when one goes for big debt programs and fiscal stimulus. And I'm all in favor of this, but also say if all goes well this is an insurance contract and those who benefit from this insurance i.e whose debt con corresponds to the assets that are then protected through all this intervention they must contribute to the future revenue this is their insurance payment that they have paid in other words if whenever one issues says we we sign off as a parliament we sign off a big government debt program then they should also say what triggers future return to normal times taxation and perhaps extra taxation that should preferably come from that wealth that was protected by higher debt thank you very much that's it thank you very much Walter, for this uh, extremely interesting uh, contribution um i was wondering if we can Make another attempt to uh, to get Agnes um, continuing her uh, her presentation. You think that would work, Agnes? Yes, I'm back. I'm really extremely sorry. It's uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. There is no rule on that. Uh, so I switch to another laptop. Hopefully, it's it's going to work better. Would you like me to um, uh, to share again my screen or just to explain where I was? Um, maybe you can see now. I can, can see. see? It. Yeah. So I, I don't know wh wh where I, I got lost. Uh, perhaps here, uh, where I was just saying that uh, the amount of safe assets uh, has been growing uh, over time in the EU area, but they are dense uh, related to uh, the downgrades of some countries. In that sense, COVID adds to uh, to the global um, supply of safe assets, hence it's a contribution to higher uh, higher um, neutral interest rates, hence uh, more uh, policy space, which is stabilizing. However, as already said, there is a need to consolidate, uh, but the the my, in my view, the speed of the consolidation of fiscal policy uh, needs to be uh, also uh, coordinated with what happens on the 
for instance, on a savings uh, side of the household, we know that households have been saving a lot during the crisis. Uh, we hope that uh, the savings rate will come back to a pre-crisis level, but if they stay higher, then um, there is more saving in the system and in there needs to be a more supply of safe assets. Otherwise, we are going to uh, again save the, um, face the risk of uh, deflation. Uh, also, we have to, to, to factor in uh, high investment, of course, uh, uh, related to the transition. Now, uh, in the EU area, the making of the policy mix, as, as we know, is extremely difficult. Uh, not not uh, only because there are 19 fiscal authorities, uh, so, so the coordination with monetary policy is complicated because there is no such thing as a EU area treasury. But even if we concentrate on, on the member states, um, if you think of a sequencing of uh, fiscal consolidation, not to repeat uh, the mistake of uh, after the previous crisis where everybody had uh, consolidated at the same time, uh, there are two, uh, two uh, po possible routes. The first one is to say that due to the stability and growth pact and market reactions, high debt countries should consolidate first. But it may be that these high debt countries are also those ha that have suffered more from the crisis. Hence, the output gap is still negative. Hence, you would uh, ask low debt countries to consolidate first. So you, you see that uh, it's not so easy to, uh, to um, uh, design the sequencing of, uh, the, of the adjustments. Uh, the only thing we know is that not everybody should consolidate at the same time. And then, as I was saying before, accompanying policies are extremely important. Uh, what's going to happen with macroprudential policies, for instance? Uh, we know that the Basel gaps are extremely high today, so there's a need also to tighten macroprudential policies. But it will depend, of course, also on the speed of uh, the consolidate, of the um, normalization of monetary policy. What will happen in Germany if there is an increase in minimum wage? We know that pre-crisis uh, excess uh, savings in Germany were mostly uh, in uh, the corporate sector. So if there are higher wages, then this change, this could be a, a game changer uh, for Germany and hence uh, would add to aggregate demand in the euro area and make it easier for other countries to consolidate. And of course, there is a, there's a green transition and the additional investment that will come with the green transition. So I would, would like to finish with a little bit of uh, political economy and show you uh, just the evolution of the level of GDP over time. Uh, starting 2010, uh, 100 in 2010, in a number of large EU area countries, and also the, the range between the first and the third quartiles among member states. What I want to say here is that large EU area countries are outside the range between the first and the third quartiles, meaning that the, actually the median of uh, GDP is um, well above the average which means that it is even more difficult to design a meaningful uh, policy mix because uh, smaller countries will uh, think that it's time to consolidate very fast. They do not feel in charge of the aggregate fiscal stance. Uh, but uh, those countries, larger countries, uh, will, uh, will want to, uh, to consolidate uh, at a slower pace. Uh, but in some cases, like uh, for Spain, Italy and France, they have uh, very high debt. So then there is a kind of uh, discrepancy. And on top of that, there is also a, a, a risk of a rise to the top in terms of current accounts. We know that um, uh, Spain and Italy used to have a current account deficit. And uh, after the previous crisis, they have moved to a surplus. And now it's only France, the large, uh, in terms of large euro area countries that runs a deficit. And if all countries uh, increase their savings, public savings and private savings, then uh, this is also the recipe for deflation. And Barry said that, that uh, uh, avoiding deflation is a major, uh, is a major ingredient uh, to, to uh, be successful in the deleveraging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, maybe um, we we uh, we invite the three speakers, maybe in the same order, to to respond to what the others have said. If I just wrap up a few things 
Um, I think uh, one of the key messages I, I think of Barry is that governments need to restore their borrowing capacity soon post pandemic. But he concludes that there are actually no simple solutions. Um, by, 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 by contrast, um, um, uh, well, Trout, well, she doesn't have any simple solutions, but she proposes some solutions like a GDP growth linked bonds, um, uh, perhaps a uh, introduction of a sovereign debt restructuring, orderless, orderly sovereign debt restructuring uh, scheme, um, and maybe also taxing, that's how I read her proposal, taxing the wealthy uh, more since after all, um, the debt that has been created uh, post pandemic or during the pandemic uh, served also to to um, to maintain their their wealth, which I think is actually a very 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 good point, but politically very sensitive at the same time. And um, yeah, well, I, I guess as warned uh, very rightly so that uh, to the extent that we resort to fiscal consolidation, we should definitely not do it uh, all at the same at the same time, and, and she also suggests that we need tighter macro prudential policy, which to 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 uh, prevent the sort of boom bust cycles that would otherwise uh, occur, for which uh, all the other speakers have also uh, issued warnings. Uh, let me let me stop there and ask Barry to come in and and to respond to some of these things. Let me make a couple of. Um comments. The first one uh, is to echo what Valtrad said about the uh, tension between the EU's fiscal rules and the climate change challenge. And I will do this by sharing my screen. Uh, if, if you can see this, can you? I think you can. Um, this is my project syndicate column that came out uh, 20 minutes ago that uh, is precisely about the tension between the fiscal rules and uh, um, uh, the challenge of greening Europe's economy. Uh, I, I, I saw um, a question in the chat from Royal Beetsma that's closely related to this as well about what we can uh, expect the uh, effect of next generation EU to be on uh, the EU's potential growth rate. Uh, and my expectation would be, if intelligently invested, it can increase the growth rate relative to what it would have been otherwise. And the relative to what it would have been otherwise is uh, a big caveat because of the danger that growth will be negatively affected by neglect of uh, climate change challenges. And the second caveat, of course, is that with a lag that I think for these investments in green and digital technology to pay off in terms of faster potential growth. We're going to have to wait for European business and society and government to reorganize what they do on a daily basis to take advantage of the growth potential of these new technologies. Finally, on Valtred's three uh, suggestions at the end, I think that uh, uh, it, it's clear that um, sovereign debt restructuring mechanism uh, will not happen outside of Europe, outside of the European stability mechanism, not only because of, of opposition from uh, uh, emerging markets and the U.S. Congress, but more generally because there is no, no global government or uh, th think about the challenges of making the World Trade Organization work. And, and, and now double or triple them. And you can imagine the governance challenges around uh, sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. I, I, I do think the um, uh, idea of uh, GDP index bonds is a good one. And the paradox, of course, is that it's been a good one for decades now. And uh, maybe uh, coming out of the pandemic, there will be an appetite for finally doing something about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess you want to come in. 
Thank you. Uh, about what, what uh, Barry just said about uh, the climate change, and so I'm going to read, of course, the, the piece, uh, but I have a problem with the um, definition of the counterfactual. So if you take one country in isolation, and the country, suppose the country does it completely well in terms of uh, reduction of emissions, and this is ex extremely expensive, so there's an increase in debt, and the other ones don't do the job, then uh, you get the worst of, of, all, uh, of all worlds where with higher debt and you still have the lower GDP because the other ones have not do, done the job. So in terms of policy decisions, uh, it, it's difficult to say that uh, if you don't invest in climate change, then uh, you will have a reduced uh, GDP. Uh, it's di difficult to make this point, in my view. It's easier within the e EU because there is this coordination around the Fit for 55 project. So in that case, uh, it, it's, it's already a block that will uh, follow the same policies. But for indi an individual country, and this is something that is really problematic uh, when you decide on public investment and to have uh, and to finance part of it uh, through debt. What, what, what's your view on that? Yes, Barry, you want to respond right away? I, I, I think it's a good point, and I think it is uh, one of Europe's signal advantages that it has institutions and, and a tradition that can, in principle, deal with these coordination problems, which uh, arise both in terms of dealing with climate change, but also in terms of dealing with fiscal consolidation, as uh, Agnes's uh, presentation made very clear. Thank you. I mean, I, uh, I agree. Yeah, I agree with the, that basic point. Uh, it, in fact, this is exactly what I also wanted to say. The EU is a club of rich countries relatively rich countries, uh, can try out certain policy ideas that other countries can't, and the US doesn't want to because we also know that it is uh, not necessarily to its advantage. Um, but the, the EU can impose on others standards uh, through closing markets if others don't comply. This comes across often and will come across often as you know green protectionism, just as it is accused of social protectionism. But if it's done in good faith and, and with being clear about the policy goals, I think one can ex explain that to like-minded countries and perhaps help those countries that, that would really uh, suffer from that. Now, I'm, I'm sounding very uh, optimistic, which on the whole I'm not, because very often the collective decision-making and that you have this collective power leads also to the fact that one can use these arguments that none wants to be first and they collectively uh, you know protect each other against more bold initiatives um, and say oh otherwise we will as a as an area lose out and the uh, US commentary on these things often doesn't help either because one always has um, has the fear that one is seen as this old continent with its its being a bit behind those dynamic uh, forces in the United States. On that, I think the continent will have to grow up uh, and do what is, after all, good for the living standards of its people and should be democratically actually attractive. What I wanted to ask you too is this whole, I have never quite got my head around what the R minus G uh, formula should actually tell us about fiscal governance. How could it be used? I mean, obviously, it is not a rule or a standard. In fact, if you really make it to the, the middle and the core of your fiscal governance, it, it could lead to very pro-cyclical debt consolidation as well. Whenever R goes up uh, without financial repression, then you would have, have to, to you know, reduce your debt. Uh, a lot, and that may or may not be the right thing in the particular situation. So, what is the role of this R minus G differential? You think in say fiscal governance of of Europe or countries generally? That sounds like a very clear question. Does 
Barry, do you want to uh, want to reply? Yeah, I don't. I I I don't think R minus G is relevant for governance per se. It's relevant for thinking about uh, what kind of uh, fiscal effort is required to maintain the sustainability of public debt. So if you look at how R minus G is used in the debt sustainability analysis that is an appendix to every IMF Article 4 report, what you see is that they look at a, a range of plausible scenarios for R minus G as kind of a consciousness raising device to help uh, the relevant policymakers focus on uh, how, how much of a, a risk may exist in the future of, of the debt spiraling out of control or the public sector not being able to uh, meet the next challenge it faces. And um, I guess you want to, to come in there? I agree that um, RMSG uh, can be thought about when you, uh, when you think of the 60% that probably is uh, a bit remote uh, today. And, and the priority should not be to rush back to 60% probably. And one reason is the low level of RMSG, whether it's positive or negative is not really the point. The, the fact that it's, it's low uh, is more important. Um, now, uh, uh, there are risks on, on that, and this needs to be uh, factored in, in terms of uh, taking some, uh, in, in terms of prudence. Now, other people are advocating using this as a guideline for fiscal rules. And here, I agree with you, uh, Walter, that that um, it's a bit tricky because uh, there are two variables. They can go in the same direction, or they can go in the opposite direction, and you have four uh, cases, and and the uh, optimal policy is di is different in these four cases. It's not just R minus G is wh where R goes, where G goes, independently one from the other. And on top of that, you can have a demand. So all and also uh, all the macroeconomic analysis over the last decades have has been thought about um, in a in an environment where we mostly have demand shocks. And if you think as the transition, as a succession of supply shocks, which could be the case, uh, then all uh, this analysis needs to be rethought because um, obviously uh, you can have a higher R, a low G uh, following a supply shock. Thank you. Um, and there was a, there was a quick, uh, question on chat also by Rule Bates uh, to Waltrout, which is on the GDP linked bonds. Uh, so, Rule agrees on its usefulness, but argues that it will be difficult to get the market off the ground. The issuance of inflation index bonds by the US also initially suffered from a high risk premium to time to have a liquid market. So, what is your, your view on this? How, how, you know, what time frame should we be thinking about for? setting this up if, if it's at all possible. As I said, I think if one never has the experience with it, then it remains an exotic product. And if only countries like Bulgaria and so on issue them, um, then yeah, then it doesn't become a mainstream. But is there a certain scale if EU fiscal authorities would commit the 10%, perhaps a rising share of their um, bond issue would be GDP growth linked, then that's another matter. I find the inflation indexing a bit of another is not a comparable thing. Inflation is much more under the control of central banks. I mean, they can engineer a recession and then they bring down inflation. I mean, that one thing they can do. Uh, so it's a policy variable. And then, of course, it's all about the trust in the central bank. I'm talking about genuine uncertainty. And why should it be that, uh, you know, the public at large, the taxpayers with their representative governments should bear all these risks while the bond investors have a safe interest rate? I don't see that. And so something has to change there. And if that becomes 
one possibility that in the beginning may have to raise slightly higher, have a higher risk premium, but in a very low interest rate environment, I think that is bearable um, for having at the same time this, this, uh, this insurance, this implicit insurance that the GDP index bond carries. I would add to that actually that um, we had the same debate uh, in the last 15 years around collective action or collective representation clauses, um, which are designed to make uh, restructuring somewhat easier. It was alleged that they would increase borrowing costs for governments once multiple European governments moved in the same direction. They were added and they did not increase borrowing costs. Hmm. Paul, there is an interesting question in the chat as well. Yeah, I noticed that. I, I totally agree. Um, so to what extent uh, can actually democracies as they function at the moment or maybe functioning in the future underpin uh, a, a, a massive fiscal consultation? That's how I read, read the question, but you, you've read it too. So whatever your interpretation is, I would be extremely curious to your, uh, to your answer. Well, it, it is true that Nicolae Ceausescu uh, was able to extinguish Romanian public debt in a decade, but look, you know, not in a democratic system, but look what happened to him. Um, I think uh, uh, democracies are messy and they make fiscal consolidation messy, but I think we know that uh, uh, reconciling democracy with fiscal consolidation, uh, one has to look to things like the extent of political polarization. If the, uh, the views of the left and the right are very different, non-overlapping, um, each group will spend on its preferred social programs when in office for fear that it won't get them when out of office across party uh, coalitions you need to sustain consolidation become harder. So I'm more pessimistic about the United States than I am about Germany from this point of view, partly because of the different uh, um, electoral institutions as well. So uh, our electoral institutions uh, in, in the United States together with gerrymandering and the electoral college and all that are set up to sustain political polarization where lo and behold in, in, in Germany or the Netherlands, you can actually build cross party coalition governments, which I think in principle are better placed to sustain fiscal effort. So may I add a word to that? Uh, within European countries, it is really striking to see that equally democratic countries can move in opposite directions in terms of the deficit and the consolidation and the dynamics of debt over time. So probably it's not the, the, the regime itself, but it's, uh, well, there's a literature on uh, developing countries about a fragmentation and, uh, of the society, and it goes in the same direction as what uh, Barry was just saying. When you have a very uh, fragmented uh, uh, society, then the ability to raise taxes is uh, reduced because, uh, well, you, you, can draw the, you can write down the model. Uh, so um, I think it's more the uh, social um, uh, coherence uh, than uh, the regime itself, but uh, I'm not a specialist on all of that. But I'm struck, I, I, I'm struck by the, the differences across the EU. I think that's a very important uh, observation, and I, I do agree that societal fragmentation, Belgium being the best example, there's nothing in Belgium inherent that should make it such a high debt country, but there is something that holds the country only together if you can, uh, you know, help one deindustrialized region by transfers to, to by the other, and there is a blocking majority and so on. Uh, a PhD, former PhD student of mine has written a wonderful book in the red about this and has also even non-European examples for this. On the other hand, the idea that public choice obviously is democracy, just as a 
checks and balance on government and therefore the government becomes credit worthy but also cannot go out of out of line that is to me a bit too optimistic i mean one problem to which the eu's fiscal rules arguably in a their very imperfect way try to react is that the current generation may exploit the future generation right the eu wants to protect always the outside of national democracies i mean that is one of the values of the eu to which i can actually fully subscribe that's the foreigner big firms being migrants whatever eu migrants and uh, future generations that are not part of the current democratic decision making and you have to protect them because it is true that we make we in, incur debt for things that do not necessarily benefit that future generation a lot of of roads we built uh, actually definitely um, damage them in terms of the, the, the carbon footprint that they, they allow us to do today. So one has to start thinking about, and this was my idea of saying, when you incur public debt, then also think of how you finance it. You, you, you do protect usually contemporary assets that are the correlate of this debt. And that would be the fair contract also to tell the contemporary contemporary voters today to say, look, public debt is not just, uh, you know, uh, one of these typical things that profligate governments do. It is an insurance contract and we do it for that reason. Uh, and that should, I hope, somehow also uh, increase support for future tax rises when that link is made. Well, that sounds uh, sounds very hopeful, but uh, <laughs> um, um, how how realistic is it that uh, is it that indeed we can commit um, basically the the upper the elite the, uh, the high uh, who own uh, say sixty seventy percent of uh, of all wealth in a country to commit to future taxes to finance as that uh, issue today um, do 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 we all share this optimism or or do we really uh, feel confident enough that we can explain this and should we should we be explaining this to suggest those are just my thoughts on it. well in a sense this is already happening with the BEPS uh, initiative uh, maybe it's not by chance that it uh, <clears throat> it succeeded in the middle of the pandemic, where governments are in a, looking for for resources, and uh, they are they want to do it in a way that is uh, uh, that appears to be fair. Um, so it, it would fit your, your 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 view, and I think it's a very interesting view that. Uh, that during this pandemic, part of the uh, support by governments uh, aimed at protecting existing assets uh, in existing firms, you would say, and this this needs to be repaid later on. And as we know, um, it could be repaid by a VAT tax, but this is a very very uh, regressive way to do it. So through corporate taxation, this is uh, probably. Uh, quite um, natural. So in a sense, this is already happening. Uh, this would be my, my reaction. Uh, of course, uh, it's not the end of the story. Okay, Does, do, do the others share, share this view? I, I would be really, really curious. Well, the, uh, the so-called billionaires tax came onto the public policy agenda in the United States for about 10 minutes this year, it's disappeared. That's why I think it would be wrong to just say tax the rich, although I'm all in favor of tax the rich, but uh, it must be the middle classes. Their household, the, the housing values have been protected massively. Their savings are protected whenever you bail out a bank. This needs to be made clear because otherwise it's always, it feeds into these conspiracy theories as if all public debt just serves the, you know, the super wealthy. It is a problem of the United States that it has actually a too progressive tax system. If you have a somewhat less, somewhat less progressive tax system, then it's not, then the, the, the wealthy do not immediately throw all their lobbying resources at it. And it is good for people, also for the middle classes, to know we are protected through these policies too. 
And there I'm a bit more optimistic that there is at least some people who have a safe income who were protected through all this thing that uh, through all this this pandemic and through all the shocks of the last 15 years. But there's an insight that at some point my savings should perhaps a levy on it. My uh, home ownership should have a, a, a higher uh, a tax on it. We do need to, to start that conversation. And I'm not so pessimistic uh, that one cannot make the argument uh, if one makes clear there was actually an insurance provided and that benefited those who are well off and have a safe salary and safe, safe jobs more than those who are now uh, in these very marginal jobs and situations. Well, thank you. That's, that's all really food for thought. I think we are approaching the end of uh, the webinar because it's almost half uh, past uh, six. Is there still a burning question somebody feels inclined to, to be able to answer? Uh, make any comments you wish. Please, please go ahead. I don't see any questions anymore on the Q&A uh, um, chat, so, so feel free to, uh, to, uh, to come in. Maybe I can uh, ask one last question, and this is um, about fiscal rules. Um, Valtraud took a very strong position about the irrelevance or undesirability of fiscal rules and a preference for uh, standards or principles. I think we may have lost our colleague, uh, Rule Batesma, but who has recently um, chaired a committee producing um, scenarios for uh, economic growth, uh, consistent approaches to uh, economic growth uh, in the EU, and it considered a number of different options, and it specifically rejected a move from rules to standards as um, something which should be uh, regretted. Many, there were many other different options on which could be aggregated in uh, in different ways. So I, I'm curious, uh, particularly what um, Barry and uh, Agnes uh, think of uh, this idea, especially the proposals by Blanchard et al. and Martin et al., which are really about uh, using um, uh, stochastic uh, modeling to estimate uh, debt sustainability with a, a kind of margin of safety and making that the focus for the discussions uh, between the Commission and Member States and within uh, the Council. And maybe Baltraud can also say something about this because, of course, it's a rather uh, technical and technocratic uh, proposal, which might be hard for citizens to get their minds around. So I'm curious uh, what you think, uh, you all think of those uh, proposals or just generally whether uh, a reform set of fiscal rules have a, a, a central place to play in the future European fiscal framework. I'm, I'm happy to start. I um, am not in favor of fiscal rules because I don't think they will be obeyed. Rules that are uh, dr drivers obey rules that make for traffic safety and do not obey arbitrary traffic rules. And I think similarly, the arbitrary rules that Europe has in place starting in 1992, but having accumulated since then are not credible because they're not connected with current reality. I think uh, the best we can do is hope for a, a accepted set of standards and a strengthened set of institutions. So Jonathan, you mentioned stochastic programming, but stochastic programming by whom? Uh, the other element here is uh, stronger independent fiscal councils or committees like you have in the Netherlands, together with uh, some kind of mechanism uh, to uh, reconcile what they do with what the European Commission does in terms uh, of 
analyzing debt sustainability over time. And uh, efforts as, as what was implied by one of the participants earlier about communicating the out outcome of those deliberations better to the public. Uh, that's a messy, complicated way uh, 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 approach to fiscal governance. I think it's the only workable one. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to write, yes, you want to, to add yeah. a last word? I agree that there is no complete contract. So the idea that the rules are going to uh, be redesigned in a way that is resilient to uh, anything that happened, uh, it's really naive. Uh, however, uh, I would say that, I would also say that um, rules are, easy, are easier to communicate than uh, stochastic simulations. And I, I'm a bit doubtful about stochastic simulation, by the way, because uh, you have a kind of illusion of uh, scientificity where you draw uh, the shocks and the correlation between the shocks um, from past uh, distributions. And there is no um, certainty that the future distribution will be, will be the same. The, and so I, I tend to prefer uh, to the, 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 the way uh, they do in uh, micro, micro prudential regulations with uh, stress tests. Uh, st stress testing where you have a detrimental scenario and you look at what happens to, to the debt in that scenario. I think it's it's easier to understand and it's, it doesn't pretend to be uh, scientific with uh, confidence bands and so on. And then, um, it, of course, and I, I, I still think that we need some form of guidance. Um, the, the rules today are over, um, there are too many rules, so it, it's uh, over determined, uh, you over constraint. When it's, uh, fiscal policy is over constraint, we need to find a way uh, to um, have governments on board uh, to commit uh, to a, a kind of uh, so within within some guidelines to uh, commit to a path and and then uh, to communicate on this path uh, in agreement with uh, the Commission, uh, of course. Um, uh, so it will be easier uh, at, at that. In my view, it would be easier uh, to comply with the, with the rules. Uh, there's, there's a kind of uh, convergence within experts in uh, what kind of rules could, would be uh, more appropriate, more resilient, more simple. And there's also a kind of uh, convergence between policymakers for, <laughs> based on different, uh, different features. Uh, they want to safeguard investment and they understand that the rules need to be simple. Uh, more simple and so on and so forth. Uh, there, is, there will still be a need for flexibility, uh, whether it's f flexibility for, for the path of adjustment or flexibility when you, uh, uh, when you assess uh, the compliance. So, and here uh, there's a need to, to, to think who uh, will be in charge of the, um, of, of the judgment, actually, the commission. Uh, the Commission, with the help of the European Fiscal Board, with the help of the National Fiscal Board. Uh, so all these, uh, if, you, if you want to introduce more flexibility, then you also need to uh, be very careful on who exerts the judgment and still have gov the government, national government uh, uh, on board and in charge of fiscal policy. So this is uh, what we need to think about in the next, uh, in the coming, uh, the coming months. Actually, if you don't like uh, the rules, if you don't like the stability and growth pact, well, and, and also the bottom line of, of all this is that un governments understand that they need to adjust whatever rule it will, it's going to be very hard to adjust. So in a sense, uh, today it's a bit of second order, what kind of rule exactly you have, because the bottom line is you need to adjust. <laughs> and this is what is uh, hard to, to, to implement. Um, uh, if you uh, think about a macro, then macro imbalances procedure, which is a kind of standard, uh, it has worked even less than stability and growth pact. So, so I, I would, I don't think that moving to standards will really s solve the problem. I don't think I have anything useful to add to these two contributions. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think we're running, we've run out of time. Uh, I think it was an extremely interesting debate, which uh, was lots and lots of food for thought. Uh, 
Um, allow me to thank you very much for your participation and just uh, and end with, a, with noting that uh, we do plan to have another follow up to, to this event uh, once uh, the Commission has issued its, uh, well, basically, uh, how uh, a document about how it will go about uh, the fiscal rules uh, once they're, they've been reinstated. Um, and that is probably around uh, this spring. Anyway, I will keep you posted. Thank you very much again for your Thank participation. You. I hope to see you soon uh, again, and uh, if, if possible at all, you know, under more normal circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you.